been to IPAM several times, and as much as I like Brentwood, this is really, really nice. Um, so, um, right, so the, I'm, I'm giving two lectures, and I sort of, um, it's sort of through composed. Uh, so I'll just stop in an hour, and then pick it up again um, at my next talk. So, um, right, now the notes that I have here, um, I will post them somewhere. I'll send it to whoever wants it, um, convert them to PDF first. Um, one thing I'm noticing is that I, um, usually I like to like zoom, uh, and it doesn't work with this technology. So, uh, so anyway, uh, apologies for that, but when you get the notes, you'll be able to do the zooming. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, classification of um, what I've been told I should start calling modular fusion categories, okay. because modular tensor categories maybe um, could potentially be not semi-simple. Yeah. So, um, but, but anyway, the, and there's, there's different generalizations. I'm, I'll probably slip up and call them modular tensor categories. Um, so the, the objectives of this course, um, so I've been writing syllabuses lately, and this is the sort of thing you have to put in. So uh, I want you to certainly know what is a modular fusion category, um, what are some of the basic constructions, um, and we'll also have this um, goal, so the kind of overriding goal, which is, as Dimitri said, is overambitious or maybe impossible, is uh, the classification of, um, say, modular fusion categories up to equivalence. And so uh, two of these words are probably uh, expecting too much. So um, probably we should do something like up to maybe not equivalence, um, but maybe we can say, you know, like up to something else, like maybe modular data. And sometimes maybe that'll even be too much to expect. It's not really a classification per se. It's maybe a characterization. So, um, so with those sort of caveats, let's, let's proceed. So, and, and um, some of the ideas that I hope um, will, will come across is the idea of, of wit classes as a way of thinking about classification, um, classification by rank, maybe classification by dimension. Okay, so here's the sort of categorical family tree of modular categories. Um, and so um, I've sort of mapped this out, and you can see very faintly underneath each of these, there's some symbol, which if you zoom in, you would uh, see what they are. Um, but um, the point is, it's just sort of um, kind of a, a little idea of how, how these different words are, are defined, just some kind of reminders. So the idea really is we start with something very basic, just a category, and we ask for it to be additive. And now additive is a structure. So it's an extra structure. It's like a direct sum, basically, on your category. And um, an additive category can be potentially abelian. So that's a property that it may or may not have. Um, and uh, similarly, an additive category might have the structure, some linear algebra structure. It might be F linear. Um, and so that's like an action of the uh, underlying of some field on your category. So that's an extra structure. So I won't go through all of these. Um, but you can kind of map through that, like, ultimately, right, our goal is we want to have modular. And there's actually a couple of different routes to get there, but they all, uh, right, all roads lead to Rome. Um, so, uh, right, so you can kind of pass through thinking of monoidal categories, and then you want rigidity, which is a property, as Dimitri told us, and then there's a pivotal structure, which might have the property of being spherical, and then... Uh, if you add non-degeneracy, then you get modular. Or you can kind of go another way. You start adding structure, um, kind of, uh, well, anyway, you have to go through monoidal and braided, balanced, ribbon, and sort of um, some of these things kind of correspond, like if you have a braided monoidal category that is balanced, uh, uh, then right, the rigidity somehow, cor uh, or rather the pivotality of a rigid category corresponds to this being balanced. Sphericity is like ribbon. So you can kind of add these words on and see where you get. But in the end, we're looking at modular. The key here maybe is this non-degeneracy. 
which says that the symmetric center or the Muger center is trivial, or alternatively, um, so that's if you haven't defined a spherical structure yet, so you don't know how to write down an S matrix necessarily, but if you have an S matrix, then the de determinant being non-zero is the same. So there's, there's different ways of getting it. Okay, so yeah, anyway, I invite you to um, transverse through these things sometime. So let me be a bit more explicit about what a modular category is, just sort of list the key things here. So it's, again, I'll be working over the complex number, so it's monoidal. Um, so a monoidal you can think of being as a sort of a categorification of the notion of a monoid. So a monoid is like a group, just you don't necessarily have inverses. And so this is sort of the categorical version of that. Um, and so there's some axioms that go along. In particular, you have the pentagon axioms um, describing sort of the associativity here. We asked for it to be semi-simple. Um, and uh, recently, lots of people are interested in dropping this condition. But uh, the idea is every object should be a direct sum of um, simple objects. Um, so a simple object is just an object so that the space of arrows from that object to itself is a one-dimensional vector space. Um, uh, so it should be linear, exactly that Aham spaces are vector spaces to start with. Uh, rigidity, um, which uh, Dimitri discussed, so it's just this sort of existence of duals, and we often look at them in terms of the corresponding morphisms, like this. Um, so we expect it to be braided. So there's some um, nice uh, hexagon axioms um, related to that, so it's kind of a commutivity, if you like, categorification of abelian monoid. Um, we expect, uh, we ask for it to be finite rank, so there's finitely many simple objects, um, and we often denote the collection of isomorphism classes of uh, simple objects as, in this way, as sort of irreducibles in C. It should be spherical, so in particular, pivotal, and that pivotal structure should be spherical. So that corresponds to some twists. The word spherical kind of comes from this idea that when you draw the twist on a sphere, you can kind of push it around the back. Um, and so it's kind of, that's where the word comes from. That's just a, a way of remembering this word. And finally, there's this non-degeneracy, which can be expressed in two different ways. I've expressed it in a different way before, um, but it should be non-degenerate, which says that the matrix that you get by taking traces of things, traces of the double braiding, you get these uh, scalars, form a matrix, and that matrix should have non-zero determinant. So you might wonder why, why modular categories, at least mathematically, they, they kind of arose as a, a way of trying to understand um, how to um, get invariants. And in particular, it's sort of just the right amount of things so that you can talk about like these uh, ribbon diagram graphical calculus. And uh, together with this non-degeneracy sort of gives you a way of, of, um, uh, of well, it's, it's sort of an extra condition that gives you a way of constructing two plus one TQFTs from these categories. So that was kind of historically, I think, how the definition came out. Um, okay, let me pause here and just see if anybody has any questions about the, the axioms here. Yeah. I'm having a hard time remembering what you mean by the spherical. Yeah. So the thing is, so the sphere, so of course a pivotal structure is a structure that um, is an isomorphism between um, X and it's double dual. Um, but because you have a braiding, you have another way of sort of going the other way, X double dual to X. Um, uh, and, um, and so you can kind of compose these, and this gives you the spherical structure. So maybe if I go back here, I don't know if it makes it clear. Another, what you can't really see it that well, but, uh, but here, another way of thinking about spherical is that the trace yeah, you really can't see that. Um, it, basically, if you take the trace of F, there's two ways of doing it, kind of going one way using 
pivotality, there's a left trace, and then there's also a right trace, and you want them to be equal. So that's the sphericity. And again, this kind of, you can imagine taking that, that loop that you're using to close it, push it around the back, and that's why the word comes up. Okay, I, I want to make a comment. I don't like if historians will say, I think, uh, if a knot is here, he won't be happy. So, uh, I don't like my idea of change from water to beauty. I think that's always the case. Uh, and I don't like the idea of change from water to beauty. So, the term water transit can be invented by Greg Moore and the knot design for the famous paper. Uh, and then, there's a lot of people who say, well, it's not really a change from water to So, that's what the water transit can be is. And uh, try it to find the way for UKT later. It's only, of course, later to find the other same. But the first invention is not designed with the drug more. But it's called more defensive Yeah. Well, okay. if you just say, like, how do you feel about if we just clarify the modular categories? And then I'm fine with the modular tensor. Actually, I would use not modular tensor. Yeah. So I would use modular category to call okay. not semi simple too. But, but I'm just saying. Okay. Yeah, I didn't, I, I, yeah. I didn't go, the, I didn't do the history far enough back. I think Taraev was inspired by. Uh, by that, he acknowledges that in his papers, that he was inspired by the more uh, exactly. uh, cyber to give the axiomatization. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't mention names, but now that we have them out there, that's good. Okay, so, yeah, so any other questions? Yeah. In the diagram that you showed in the beginning, um, those arrows are they? Were they like say see it was modular? We have three arrows coming in. Does that mean you're requiring three things or? Um, uh, right. Yeah. So you um, and in fact the two of them really are sort of the same thing. Like if you go like spherical and um, ribbon, if you're in the presence of braiding, uh, right? Uh, yeah, spherical and braided is the same thing as ribbon. So it's sort of multiple paths to the same thing. It's just where you layer these on. It was just adding structure or properties. So. Okay, so um, right. So let's talk about some of the things that we extract from these uh, th these definitions um, in order to kind of actually calculate in these categories. So um, uh, right, it's a bunch of axioms. So what can you do in terms of um, having uh, some invariants or some numbers to work with. So um, some of these you've already seen. So of course we have our simple objects and uh, the fusion rules that come from the dimensions of these spaces of uh, morphisms between Xi tensor Xj and Xk. You have associativity constraints that you extract from, well, the fact that it's associative. So that's the famous F matrices. And I haven't put on any indices there, but there are six. Um, the braidings also, uh, right? We can parameterize these in this way. Um, so these, these pictures should sort of uh, correspond to some vector in some vector space. And when you apply the braiding operation, this is a linear transformation. And these, these are the, the numbers that come out. Um, there's the twist matrix, which is just the matrix consisting of the, uh, the twist values. Um, there's the S matrix that I've already discussed. And part of the S matrix are the dimensions of the simple objects. And so we have kind of a pictorial way of, of representing these things. And together, so the, the T matrix and the S matrix are what we usually call the modular data. So that's an important bunch of information from it. Um, okay, and then from these, we have more kind of notation definitions that you've seen before. So um, the, the dimensions of the simple objects we denote by just di, and then the dimension of the category is the sum of the squares of those. Um, the fp dimension was already mentioned also. So this is just the largest eigenvalue of the matrix that you get from these um, fusion coefficients. So you can form a matrix. Ni, which has j, k entry, ni, k, j. And well, you just look at the largest eigenvalue, and we've seen this is uh, some uh, positive real number, in fact, bigger than 1. OK, so this is just some notation, really. So let's look at a very explicit example. So 
the famous Fibonacci theory. So in this case, there are two um, anion types or two simple object types. Um, just the trivial one, the vacuum, and then this Fibonacci thing. And so we know exactly all of the fusion coefficients. So these are the ones that are equal to one, the rest are zero. Um, and we can start writing down bases for the vector spaces we're interested in. So for example, the Hom space between a Fibonacci and two, the tensor product of two Fibonacci particles, or anions, um, ha is one dimensional, and we have some basis that looks like this. And in some sense, we think of this as a basis for kind of the space of uh, kind of labelings of this pair of pants. It's kind of the standard way of thinking about this space. Um, and right, okay. Um, and similarly, there's only other, one other one that we need to write down in this theory, which is um, the, the space between um, the trivial object and two, and the tensor product of two Fibonacci particles. And so this looks something like this. And um, again, so um, Shenghan mentioned this already. There's some choice of basis going on. Um, you, can, you can ask that this should be the, um, um, right, the, um, sort of the birth operator, but it might be some scalar multiple of that. So there's some, there's some playing around with coefficients here. Question? Um, are you sure you have a question? But what is the home? Um, uh, what is this notation? Yeah, yeah so though, that is the, um, the space of morphisms between two objects. So HOM XY. Yeah. And so usually in a category, the objects have no structure at all, but the morphisms are assumed to at least form sets. If you have any two objects, there's a set of morphism between them. In this case, it's more than a set, it's actually a vector space. So that's part of being F linear or C linear in our case. Yeah. So that's the only way we can kind of get our hands on anything to write down is by passing to morphisms. And so we have, uh, we have full data for this, this theory. Um, so I've, uh, I've written down the, the details, so the categorical dimension here. So here, the golden mean is the categorical dimension that shows up. Um, the F, the only interesting F matrix is here. We have exactly what it is. We know precisely what the um, twist, uh, the, the, the braiding eigenvalues are. Um, we know the twist, and so we can really work with this category um, just from the bottom up. Okay, so let's continue. So I want to tell you a bunch of constructions of modular categories. Um, and so um, there's, to my mind, there's kind of two things you can do. There's natural constructions that you get kind of from, um, from nature, I guess. Um, um, and then there's ones that, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, the categorical dimension is the same as the quantum dimension. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and so, um, right, so the sort of the natural constructions and then there will be some constructions that we can build from ones if we already have a supply of categories to play with. So the first one uh, to think about are these quantum group categories, which there's a lot of information behind all of this. Um, but the idea is you start with a Lie algebra, you look at the universal enveloping algebra of that Lie algebra, then you deform it in some way by some parameter Q, so by changing the defining relations. Then you look at the representations of that category. And if you specialize your uh, parameter to be a root of unity, then you get some category that's a bit complicated. But by taking a quotient category, you get something that's very often modular. And we typically denote it by uh, the, just it really depends on just G and L in the end, assuming I'm taking this particular root of unity. Okay, so that's a construction of lots of examples. And just to give you an example that you may or may not have seen before, but um, uh, maybe SO5 level 2 corresponds to G being, well, um, type B2, so SO5. And the root of unity is um, related when L is equal to 10. And in this case, so if you've studied Lie theory at all, you know that the irreducible representations of a Lie algebra, a simple Lie algebra, um, can be described as um, 
one-to-one -one correspondence with their highest weights, which live in some, so there's some geometric way of understanding these things, um, in the so-called um, uh, the vial chamber. And then to get the quantum, the, get the modular category version of this, you chop off this vial chamber and turn it into a, a vial alcove, and then you have finitely many um, sort of highest weights that can appear, and the fusion rules can be derived in some way from the, just the original Lie algebra itself, together with some, um, what do you do when you cross that boundary? You have to reflect back. So this is all something that can be studied just combinatorially, um, at least at this level, the fusion rules. Okay. So I'm explaining how, how to tensor uh, with, th say, this object here. You just sort of draw this little picture uh, and the places you land, if they're inside the vial alcove, those are the, um, uh, that's how you decompose into a direct sum of simples. So it's, there's lots that one can do, um, just a special example. Okay, good. So um, another construction, uh, which Dimitri already talked about a little bit, was um, our metric groups. So this is just, you start with a finite abelian group and a quadratic form, but in order for this to be not uh, to be modular, you insist that this quadratic form be non-degenerate, okay. which just means that well, when you can you take this quadratic form, you can construct um, <clears throat> a bilinear form, and that thing should be non-degenerate. So there's some kind of non-degeneracy buried in this. Okay. Um, and so in this case, you have this category. The objects are just correspond to elements in your group. The tensor product is just the multiplication in the group. The dimensions of all of these objects are just one. They're invertible objects. Um, the morphism spaces are uh, going to be, at least between simple objects, are just uh, one dimensional or zero dimensional if A and B don't co coincide. And the twists in this theory actually come directly from the quadratic form. It's just evaluate the quadratic form. So they're really easy and, and useful uh, modular categories uh, to play around with metric groups. So there's actually a nice theorem. So the first classification theorem is that any pointed modular category um, is of this form, okay? This gives a complete classification. So if you have a modular category and all of the simple objects are invertible, then it must be a, uh, a metric group, and it corresponds to a metric group. Yeah? Can you realize these metric group categories in some other way, or should one really think about them as being like an So you could, you could certainly find, there's lots of other constructions. Um, they, they, would, uh, they would show up, some of them would show up, for example, um, as subcategories of quantum group categories. Um, so it depends on how, well, how you define those, but, uh, right, um, but certainly all of them, like if you're allowing me to take products of uh, quantum group categories, then I think almost all of them would come that, from that. I'm not sure all quadratic forms are realized in this way. You might have to maybe zest or something. Yeah, do something. Is this an interesting question or, or no? Like, who um, really cares? Yeah, I'm, I, I like to think of them kind of as, as sort of being separate, um, right? Because, I mean, they're, they're very special and we have a classification. So. Yeah, question back there. So are all of the objects simple objects here? No. no. So um, an object, a general object in a fusion category is a direct sum of simple objects. That's the semi-simplicity constraint. Oh, okay. Sorry, in this, in this case where it's the pointed. Uh, no, sorry, yeah. Even here it's not. Even here it's not, yeah. So you're certainly, since we have, I mean, this is an abelian category, you're allowed to take direct sums of, of things. And yeah, they won't be in general simple. Yeah. So, uh, let me take on uh, the next question in a slightly different way. Um, 
I have requested, requested interest <laughs> for the following sense. So, uh, in fact, I start to believe uh, all water has a character come oh. from the alien one. There's nothing else here. So, because uh, the mathematical theory will support that. How can you have thought about it? I like that. I'll mention something. Yeah, uh, there's another thing I think is interesting, which is uh, those things that clear conformal field theory realization most of the time. So, so they are. I think I can agree they are almost all of them in the sense of all the other ones can be constructed. And they are well still using that. Yeah. So are you saying something more about the opposite direction then? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking uh, if you want to do classification, you need just do two things. Classify quadratic form and understand one construction, which is every ability, every area model of a video or not is covered by the ability. In, in the sense of if you, there's some gauging. I think that's what. Okay, so there's a different So I can go precise, which is if you take the modular data, any any model, it becomes into reducible Russian teacher to also two Z. Every reducible Russian teacher that also two Z comes from the Bayesian model. That's a view. Okay, good. So, right. So, anyway, so here's, here's a very explicit example. Um, take any odd prime. Then, uh, right here is a nice quadratic form that is non-degenerate. So, there's one for each j that's relatively prime to p. Um, but, in fact, there will be lots of equivalences among them. Uh, there's only two different j's. There's, so, there's really, it looks like there's whatever, uh, p minus 1 choices for j. And there are, but in fact, there's only two uh, categories up to equivalence. It just depends on whether J is a, is a um, quadratic residue or non-residue mod P. That's basically the, the idea. So there's some number theory way of describing this. But really, there's only two, interesting. Um, right, um, and so a very important example we've seen already is the semion theory. This is, can be, uh, can, I mean, it's pointed, so it, should come from Z2, and if you want to know precisely what the quadratic form is, it's the one where when you evaluate uh, at 1, you get I. Okay, that's it. So it's just, uh, just one of these. Okay. All right, so let me proceed. Well, let me maybe stop here, because now we'll talk about how to build new categories from, from old ones now that our quiver is full of things to play with. Let's make some metaphors. Is there a converse of that theorem, actually? So if you have any metric proof, is it always a function? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, again, uh, if Q is non-degenerate quadratic form. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, so this is, a, this is um, in the book, what we call the book, so DGNO. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, the, um, so that's, that's uh, it's a bunch of exercises in there, and I really encourage you to do those. Um, I've done them, so they're good to do. Um, okay, so now let's do some new from old. So the most basic thing that you can do is uh, if you have two categories, well, fusion, fusion, cat just fusion categories, generally you can take the Deline product, which is just like the direct product. So everything is just pairs of stuff. Okay? So that's a very natural construction. Um, uh, mathematically and, of course, physically, it's very important because this is kind of uh, bilayer construction or more than bilayer if you do it more than one, right? So you see this quite a lot. It's absolutely essential construction. Um, and um, interestingly, so um, it shows up right away when we're talking about modular categories. Then um, if you have a modular subcategory of a modular category, then it automatically decomposes in this way. So it's kind of nicer than groups in this way, right? So if you have a subgroup, or even if it's a normal subgroup, it's not going to be a direct product. That's just silly. But for modular categories, it works. Okay? So you can really decompose in this way. And so you can talk about what it means to be a prime modular category. I mean, well, you can't decompose it anymore. It contains no modular subcategories. Um, so anyway, so this is quite useful, um, it turns out. OK, so let me um, review boson condensation kind of from my, my perspective. Um, so this was, um, this has been sort of long and coming in mathematics. Um, so Bruguiere's 
and uh, Muger did some work on this, and then it was generalized in uh, this uh, paper by um, Drenfeld, Galaki, Nikchik, and Ostrich um, in one of their many papers. Um, and yeah, I'm being very sloppy with references, as you can see. I'm only using letters and not explaining which paper. But anyway, um, by all means, ask me if you really need the reference. Um, OK, so um, we can talk about rep G, which is a braided fusion category but happens to be symmetric, meaning that it's as far from being modular as possible, highly degenerate. In other words, if you take the double braiding, any pair of objects, it's just the identity okay, for all of this. So it's a symmetric category. Um, and right, um, yeah, um, more generally, if you, uh, so if you look at a modular category, then, and you look at this, this is supposed to be trivial. Okay, so that's far from being, so this is what we would call non-degenerate, would be if the only objects, simple objects, whose double braiding with everything is, uh, is the identity, that set is the Muger center, and if the Muger center is, um, well, generated by just the monoidal unit, then we call that um, modular or uh, non-degenerate. Um, now, it isn't the case that every symmetric braided fusion category is of the form rep G. More generally, um, uh, there's something called super Tanakian. So there's the possibility of having um, just something slightly beyond. But, um, but anyway, we'll uh, discuss that at some point, perhaps. So the idea here is that if you have a Tanakian subcategory, and you can think of Tanakian subcategories being kind of uh, bosons, or bosonic, um, then you can condense. And it basically just means quotient out by that, sort of smash it down and consider that to be your monoidal unit. Um, and so when you do that, um, right, you can, um, what's really happening is um, you have a new category, C sub G. It has the same objects as C, but more morphisms. Okay, and so now, right, there's, uh, if there's more morphisms, there's probably fewer objects, in some sense. I mean, fewer objects up to isomorphism. The collection of objects is the same. Um, and so, um, here's just a, a review. So, take the algebra of functions on G, sitting inside a category, so it's an algebra object, and you can build your new morphisms your new morphisms will be sort of morphisms in the old category, but sort of with this A attached. So that's one way of kind of thinking about um, how this works. And so in particular, the whole algebra A gets mapped onto the trivial uh, monoidal unit. The resulting category will be always G graded. Uh, so it looks like this, decomposes as an abelian category into a bunch of um, components, um, so that the tensor product of objects from these components behaves um, well with respect to the multiplication in the group. And um, if you take now, so this is G graded, if I take the trivial component of this, then uh, the resulting category, if what we started with was a modular category, the resulting category is again modular. So this is what I usually call the uh, boson condensation of a modular category. Um, and the dimension changes by um, right, a factor of the order of the group squared. And so you really think of this as sort of making it smaller in some, some way. OK. Um, now, this is boson condensation. right? So the, but there is, you can also condense more general things, namely connected atoll algebras which I won't go into the definition of that. Um, it's like you know, a bunch of the words that Dimitri already used, like um, separable, um, yeah, connected, um, well, anyway, some of these things. Um, right, so the idea here is instead of taking this very specific algebra object, um, we're going to take uh, some other algebra object. So that just means you have a multiplication. And um, you first take the A modules in C, so that's a new category. That's what Dimitri was calling condensation. Okay. 
Um, uh, but if you take the so-called local modules, what does this mean? Well, it just means that they braid trivially with your algebra object A. So if you take the subcategory of A modules that braid trivially with A, then the resulting category uh, here, the local modules, is again a modular category. And so this is um, very analogous to this boson condensation, but it's more general. Okay. Um, that algebra doesn't have to be rep, uh, related to rep G. It just has to be an algebra object. And that's a really interesting question to study, give, given some modular category to try to find algebras in there. In general, this is really hard. It has everything to do with you know, determining the Brouwer-Picard group and things. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite complicated. But there are some examples where you can fully characterize them. It's kind of nice. Oh, good. Uh, generalization of the first. They, it is. Look, they look different. Is there, yeah, the, one looks like a quotient. Yeah, so no, it, the answer is yes, it very much is. So if you go through the same process, you can look at, instead of thinking about it sort of in these terms, um, right, uh, the local modules, it turns out, will be precisely those that are in this, uh, sort of this trivial component. Um, I mean, in the end. So yeah, you can kind of think of, uh, think of this in terms of modules. Each one of these is a module. But then the local modules, uh, right, yeah. OK, so this is a nice, uh, nice construction. Um, so just as an example, um, if you take the representation category of the twisted double of a finite group, this always contains the representations of that group to begin with as an algebra, and in fact, it's a Lagrangian algebra. And so if you condense that thing down, you're left with nothing, which is, well, not nothing. It's, it, it's um, the smallest modular category right, back. So that's, that's just exactly one example that I'm presenting. Now, you might ask, can I go the other way? And the answer is, we certainly hope so, and lots of times, yes. So. Um, and so this brings me to the topic of symmetry gauging. So kind of the idea is um, if, you, if you condense some bosons, some rep G, the, the resulting ca category um, will naturally come with an action of that group, categorical action even. And so you can kind of um, build a bigger category out of that, um, sort of using that symmetry. And so this is called symmetry gauging. So this, there's a, um, a math paper. Um, so this is um, Shan Sui, Cesar Galindo, Julia Plavnik, and Jing Hong Wang, both of whom are here. And then there's a more physics paper, lots of examples. Bonderson, Barkeshli, um, Chung, and Wang. Um, so these are, if you're interested in seeing the details of this, look there. So the idea is you start with a modular category um, together with a, um, a, to start with just a group homomorphism from um, some group G and the braided tensor auto equivalences of C. So this is another finite group. Um, and so it's a finite group acting by braided tensor auto equivalences. And the goal is to, well, first extend, add G defects. And so that's to build a slightly bigger, well, a bigger category that's G graded with the original category as its trivial component. And then once you've done that, this will always, um, uh, you, it will always be, pot you can always look at the G equivariant objects in this new category. And um, the result will be uh, a modular category again called the G gauging. Now, boson condensation is for free. There's no choices, there's no obstructions, you just do it. Going the other way, Unfortunately, there are obstructions and there are choices to be made. Um, so, um, for example, suppose you throw on a bunch of defects, right? Um, is there a consistent fusion rule for all of those defects? Maybe, maybe not, um, right? There's lots of things you can try. 
And so there, that's, that's an obstruction, and there's a cohomological way of describing that obstruction. If that obstruction vanishes, so it is possible, then there are choices for, for various uh, things. Um, and uh, right, um, also you might get a consistent fusion rule, but it might not admit, right, it might be just a fusion ring. It might not admit associativity, right? There might not be a fusion category realization of it at all. Um, and again, there's some obstruction there, uh, cohomological obstruction. And if that obstruction vanishes, there are choices of associativity um, that you can add on. And so once you've done that, you've built yourself a, um, a G-graded uh, category, then the step two is always possible. Okay? So the real key is doing this G extension. And this is a very hard general and general question. But the nice thing is this is actually a reverse process to condensation. So if you do this, when you do this gauging, uh, it will always contain a copy of rep G, okay, because the identity is, will be an equivariant object in lots of ways. Um, and uh, if you then condense, right, that's what this whole thing is, well, you get back what you started with. Okay, so it kind of really reverses this process. And so this was proved in this, um, this paper of um, Dimitri and his co-authors. So that's great. We can reverse boson condensation. And that's a really important construction. Um, so here's a quick example. Um, if I look at the um, pointed modular category with fusion rules like Z3, I have a Z2 action given by inversion or by particle hole symmetry. Yeah. Um, that turns out to be a, a very nice um, uh, action. It lifts the fusion rules that show up are possible, you get associativity, everything comes out, the obstructions vanish. So you get a Z2 extension, which in this case is, that means, right, you have your original category, that's the trivial component, and you have one more category as your other component. And that one has exactly one simple object, which we call M, and there's a way of knowing that that was supposed to be one. Um, and it's, uh, it, so it's, quantum dimension, or its categorical dimension, will be the square root of 3. Um, when you tensor it with itself, you get the sum of the um, elements in the group. This is a so-called um, Tambara Yamagami category. And then step two, when you do the Z2 equivariantization, you get something which has at least the same fusion rules as SU2 level 4. For one of the choices, right, there's a bunch of choices as you go. And so you get a nice modular category with dimensions 1, 1, 2, square root of 3, square root of 3. Question? Uh, so the graded extension, that's a tensor category, but not necessarily a modular tensor category itself? That's right. It's a, in fact, it's a G-crossed braided tensor category. So the trivial component, of course, has a braiding because it had one to start with. And the other ones will be exactly these braidings that, uh, that Dimitri was talking about, where you use the action, and then there's a braiding uh, on the image of the object under the action. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the gauge is the reverse process of the compensation, right? Yes. But sometimes we can interpret the compensation as the gauge one form symmetry. So can we fit this gauge one form symmetry into this categorical situation? Um, I don't know what that is, gauging one form symmetry. Yeah. Maybe somebody can translate. I can't translate, no. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe I want to say we are gauging one form symmetry. So, we're not gauging, well, when you do gauging, you have to know the group symmetry to a categorical symmetry. As far as I know, that's like one form symmetry. <laughs> I don't know what that's saying. Okay, yeah, question. If your symmetry group has two different subgroups and then you want to gauge the two subgroups, is there an order problem? Uh, right, so you can do sequential gauging. 
And certainly this, this uh, so this is well uh, described in the paper of um, uh, Zheng Han and Julia and co-authors. So for example, if you take the so-called three fermion theory, okay, so this is a modular category with four simple objects, all invertible, three of which have twist minus one. It has a full S3 symmetry. And S3 is a semi-direct product of Z2 with Z3. And so you can actually do this gauging. First do, I think, the Z3 and then the Z2. And it's the same thing as doing the full gauging of S3. So yes. Right. Say again? Is that generally true? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, if you have, if it, I think if a, if, if a group is a semi-direct product uh, like this, maybe a bunch in a row, then I think you can just do them one at a time. Yeah. You have to do the, the normal stuff. First. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so we saw how to undo boson condensation. Can we undo algebra condensation? And that's kind of an open, at least partially open question. And we kind of think the answer is yes, but it hasn't been fully worked out. Some interesting examples appear in this Hopf Monad paper uh, that Cheng Han wrote. And maybe there's other, other attempts at this. Um, but uh, anyway, that's kind of ongoing. And quite interesting, I think. Maybe I can just add an advertisement. I thought this was the incredibly interesting question, but I couldn't understand it. So the point is that, as uh, Eric said, if you have a rap key, <coughs> When you condense, you get a G symmetry of the condensed module tensor pair. Now a ref G becomes an L. You can still condense it, that's not how it can be done. You still get a module tensor pair. I think it's fair to believe that some kind of symmetry also come from this condensable L. It won't be a group. So the question is, what is this? And uh, I wrote papers on. Have you hopped more? No, no, whatever. I don't think it's a final answer. So there's a question here, which is if it contains the algebra, which is not graph G, what's the nature of the symmetry on the resulting model? I think it's extremely interesting because we have the entire SPT. Do you think that a good way to approach that would be by to understand the the hot picture that the quasi hot picture and how to do this program of uh, I think I quite yeah. I think I quite already uh, it's not quite work. So the hot model is more general than that actually. And I don't believe that's the final most general set up. So I don't know the answer. Okay, very good. Let me uh continue and just maybe do one page that's kind of uh, like, a, like a prequel to maybe what Colleen will talk about a little bit. So uh, we invented another way of, of building new categories um, called braided zesting. Um, so this is uh, Delaney, Gala, uh, Delaney Galindo Klavnik, uh, myself, and Zhang Ching, who's here. Um, and so the idea is the following. You start with some modular category that is A graded. So in fact, if you have a modular category, its grading, its universal grading is group is exactly the um, group formed by the invertible objects in that category. Okay, so that's something we, we have a good handle of. Um, and then um, you have some subcategory of the uh, sort of the pointed part, so in some invertibles inside the, uh, the trivial component of this under this grading. Um, and again, I should say, A doesn't have to be the universal grading. It could be some other smaller grading and um, so forth. But OK, so the idea now is you're basically going to uh, adjust your tensor product in the category you started with by, uh, by tensoring with uh, some invertible object. So of course, you know that, uh, yeah, go ahead. Zero is the trivial component. It's a pointing part. That's a linear group, right? Uh, it, it's 
Uh, yeah, it's an agreement group, yes. Then your D and the D are the same, is that correct? You know, the D is a subgroup. Uh, D, uh, D is a symmetric category. It but could it's be. But it's pointed. It's pointed, but it could be fermion. Yeah, but that's yeah. only deeper by the Z. But yeah, that's right. Yes. I'm saying D, D are the same. It's just yes. the D can be minus one. That's right. As objects, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Right, and so you build a new fusion rule. You say, okay, what, because the point is, if you, for example, if you take a simple object and you tensor with an invertible object, it's still simple. And so there's kind of, you know, there's some room for playing around with this idea. And um, so um, this is what we try to do. And so the question is, well, does this actually, you know, give a, a fusion category? And so there's lots of things you have to try, right? This could completely ruin your associativity and so forth. But, so what you need is there's some, um, you need some co-chain, so some cohomological thing uh, that will f sort of uh, fix the associativity in some sense. Um, it, it can, so if, if, if the Z is not there, then it can be, the associativity actually can be taken to be a, a three co-cycle, perhaps the trivial one, but generally it's just, a three co-chain, in other words, a function from three copies of your group to uh, the unit circle, roots of unity. And so um, this first part is an associative zesting, so you get a new category maybe, and then you can ask, can I put a braiding on here? Well, and the braiding corresponds to some choice of, um, of isomorphisms between um, invertible objects well, an invertible object and itself, but there's some scalar associated with this. And then you can get twists as well, potentially. And very often, if you've done everything correctly, you can actually get a modular category out of this. Okay. So I, I have one little example to show you, which is just to show the kind of how the fusion rules can change. So if you start with SU3 level 3, okay, uh, this category has 10 simple objects and contains Z3. And if you do a Z3 zesting, you can actually get something that has very strange, well, new fusion rules. And so the, I've sort of drawn the fusion graph, which is sort of like, okay, go this way if you tensor with this, uh, this generating object. Now here you kind of go all over the place in some strange way. So it really scrambles the fusion rules completely. They're new fusion rules, and you actually, from this, you can get a modular category, which we discovered um, sort of when we were trying to classify modular categories some years ago, and that was actually what inspired this braided zesting uh, construction. So it's, it's brand new. It doesn't come from quantum groups directly, but it's a zesting of uh, a quantum group category. So. Um, more recently, we've realized that many times we can achieve this using old technology. Namely, um, sometimes you can take the category you're trying to zest, tensor it, so the lean product with a uh, pointed category that contains sort of this symmetric subcategory. And then there will be a diagonal copy, a diagonal bosonic thing, right? Because you have D sort of sitting inside both. And so you can condense that diagonal bosonic thing, and you'll get a new modular category. And in fact, it'll be a zesting. And we can go both ways, in, at least in some circumstances. OK, question? Is uh, the reason for calling this Yeah, I guess so. So um, like, you know, when you're cooking something, and um, it's like, you know, the flavors are just not quite there, and you want to, like, make it a little better, you, you add some zest, right? And so, yeah, this, this is what you're doing. Yeah. Can you do a bar between? Um, if no. you want to spend, you want theta, theta bar. Right? No, because you, you're taking the diagonal copy. So if there's anything fermionic, FF is a boson. So you don't need to bar it. Yeah, exactly. It's symmetric. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, second question. Is the data obvious to read off from this data and all the data? Right. So the, the braided zesting, getting the modular data is super easy. 
You can just write it down. Going, if you try to do this sort of fiber product thing, then it's tricky. So yeah, we can write down S and T directly. Yeah, yeah, we have formulas. So yeah, it's there. Yeah. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Almost done. Okay. All right. So um, I'll also mention j just again that we can take uh, the Drenfeld center. That's a nice construction. This actually starts with a spherical fusion category. You take its Drenfeld center, you always get something modular. Um, so in particular, if you start with a modular category, it's really easy. This will again be modular, and it's easy to describe. So if you have a modular category, its Drenfeld center is just like taking, uh, taking, a, taking C itself, Deline product, its reversed version. So just change the braiding, a new braiding inverse the old one. Um, and um, an example, if you take rep G, this is a, um, a braided fusion category, a symmetric braided fusion category, and you take its Drenfeld center, then it's the same thing as taking the Drenfeld double of the group and then looking at the representation category. So these are sort of well-known things. So I won't go into the details of this again because uh, um, uh, Dimitri already kind of described this, but really the idea is, yeah, so you're going to try to build a, a category um, that is modular. That's our goal um, today. And um, this is a nice construction of these things. So maybe this is a good place uh, to stop. And uh, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>